Hi, I'm Dave Barnes. And I'm John McLaughlin. And welcome to Dadville. Dadville is a podcast where we talk about life, love, and the pursuit of awesome dadding. It's funny thoughts and deep talks. So please, enjoy your time here in Dadville and enjoy this episode with... Gary Thomas! John, Dave. John, let me, can I just say something? Can I quick? start? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Listen, mm-hmm. I'm tired of hiding. <laughs> I'm tired of keeping this in. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to say it. Do it, do it, John. Summer is here. Yep. All right? And that yep. means it's full-on sunglasses season. Yes. Right? Yes. For beach days, baseball games, and everything in between. I don't know what's in between there, technically. I don't, but I, I don't know. I don't want You need that. a pair of shades. And you need a pair of shades that you don't have to baby. I've right? already got kids, John. Yeah. I don't need right. more sunglasses. I already baby kids. myself. I don't <laughs> have time to baby Let's sunglasses. Let's talk about that later, actually. Okay. John, Knockaround has been making high-quality shades that don't break the bank since 2005, mm-hmm. and they've actually been my personal go-to for years. You know, they have over 25 different no. frame styles. You didn't know that, nope, but I just I told you that. I didn't. No. So that there's something for everyone, including tons of kids' pairs. That's right. So whether you're looking to rep your favorite MLB team, that's Major, Major League baseball, baseball, spend some relaxation time in the yard. That's like a grassy that's area. That's where you sort of grow up. Yeah. And, and cruise down Main Street. That's the main. It's like one of the street. streets down through town. <laughs> With the windows down. Like Knockaround has got what you need, John. Okay, all their lenses. Let me hit you with some more info okay. that you didn't know. So help me if you say anything over 200, by the way. Okay, Dave, buckle up and sit down and roll the windows down because they have all their lenses have UV 400 protection, what? which is basically like sunscreen for your eyes. Don't actually do that. Don't do that. that. We do not yeah, endorse no, that no, no, behavior. No, no. Yeah. And with polarized adult pairs starting at 28 bucks. Yeah. Right. That, they, I spend that on coffee every day. Wow. You can get a I, few whoa. pairs to leave in your car, toss in your beach bag, lend to a friend. Yeah. Or just hint. throw it in your yard and see what happens with that pair. <laughs> It may grow a sunglass tree. This June is going to have more releases than ever. So stay tuned all month long for new collabs. That's collaborations. Collaboration. New frame styles. That's like the, the thing. What about, they look yeah, like. New colorways, which is the ways that color, color art. And more. <laughs> Dadville fans, check out knockaround.com and use the code DADVILLE15 for 15% off your order. That's DADVILLE15 for 15% off your order at knockaround.com. <laughs> oh, Gary, thank you so much for being with us today. Today, guys, we have um, an expert. First of all, he's written copious amounts of books, which already puts him way out of uh, reach for me and John ever trying to sort of track with You've him. written so many books that it's like it's a joke. It makes <laughs> me laugh. I'm like, no, that can't be. That can't be right. Yeah, it's substantial. Gary Thomas is with us today. And I'm just going to start at the top because this is, this is you, you've, you've really done it, Gary. Um, okay, so here we go. Got a BA in English literature. Perhaps that. Where'd you get that, by the way? Western Washington University, which is ranked like 378th from Newsweek. So that's, that's I was top in that 400, coveted Gary. top 400 <laughs> list of colleges. What does Newsweek know anyway? And where are they now? So who's laughing now? Um, studied under J.I. Packer, which is so cool. Received a master's degree in systematic theology, honorary doctor of divinity from Western Seminary. Um, and then uh, I love that our... Um, Producer put written a bucket of books, which I guess signifies just a copious See amount. See if you can do this in one breath. No, I can't. I'm not even going to try. But there's just a lot of books. Um, some that uh, I think a lot of people would know are obviously Sacred Marriage, uh, Devotions for Sacred Marriage, Authentic Faith. Um, there's just a lot of books. It's too many to read. Um, which is, is that ironic? Uh, he served on the teaching team at Second Baptist Church Houston for 11 years and is currently on the teaching team at Cherry Hills Community Church in Highlands Ranch, Colorado. Uh, I see that you left Houston for prettier ground and better weather. <laughs> Props to that. Uh, is an adjunct faculty member at Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon, and Houston Theological Seminary in Houston, Texas. And this is something we need to address. Um, also, Gary enjoys running in his spare time and has completed 14 marathons, and including the Boston Marathon three times. Is that true? Like, do you have a, are you running right now? Are your feet just like, are you on a treadmill under the desk? Just like <laughs> <No>. getting some <laughs> steps? <laughs> Not, although I do have a good friend who's run more marathons than I have that did a sermon on a treadmill one time. No. And he has three services, but. Uh, wow. Is the goal to get uh, a book for every marathon? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I've got more books than marathons right now, to be honest. So you do. I kind of holding it together. Houston was devastating to my marathoning because oh. it's oh. so hot and humid half of the year. You can't get up early enough to beat the humidity, and then if you wait until no. the humidity to go down, it's ninety degrees and sunny and. It's too much. I never could yeah. really conquer it. I can I grew up in Seattle. You can dress for the rain. I had three different kinds of raincoats for three different kinds of rains. I had shoes that I would swap out. You can't dress for humidity. Yeah. You can only get so naked. No. You can undress for humidity <laughs> is what you do. You know, it's funny. Um, I you started running. You can only get so naked. Yeah. Which that's your next book, that's I think. That's a direct <laughs> quote from my wife. You can only get so <laughs> <laughs> it might be the bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> a direct quote from my wife. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, living in Nashville, it gets humid. It's not humid uh, as H- Houston, but I started running because in the summers, um, I run a couple times a week. It got so hot that I started running early morning, and I liked it so much, I just kept it. But in the summers, you ha- I mean, it's like you said, you have to run that early. It's just, it's too hot. It's just, mis- John's one of these, like, he's a masochist because he's like, the more hot and the and the more I sweat, the more I enjoy running. And so where I'm like up at 6.15 running in, in you know, July, he's like, let's wait till 3.30 when it's like, you know, and I'll see him out there. And I, I think, just, I just feel like I'm already, I, like I instantly sweat. If I do any activity, I'm sweating profusely. So I'm like, look, if I'm, if I'm going to be sweating, let's sweat the whole thing. Let's go all the way. <laughs> 3 p.m., Sweat through everything. It's the thing about Houston is if you run in the morning, you don't stop sweating. You take your shower and five minutes <laughs> yeah, later, yeah. you're so good. But I got to tell you, it's you almost it a mystical feeling. What I liked about Houston, when you get up early because it's so hot and you run in the dark for 45 minutes to an hour and then it slowly gets light. I got to tell you mm-hmm. that that's worth the suffering mm-hmm. to get there. That is, I just really loved that part of the day, although in Houston, you're getting blasted by all the sprinklers at that point. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't think you're getting that. soaked either yeah, way. Yeah. There is something so nice about starting the day, you know, like you're saying, like you're running for 45 minutes in the dark and then you get to see that sunrise and you're hearing the sprinklers, all that kind of stuff. It's a great way to start the day. It is. Yeah. It agreed. is. Okay. So I, uh, to be totally honest, I could talk a lot longer about just running. I'm kind of fascinated about your marathon running, but we've got some stuff to get to. So you've been doing these marriage seminars since the year 2000, right? You've been doing these for 24 years, yeah. sacred marriage seminars. So, I mean, that's that's a lot of data and experience and couples that you've met and conversations that you've had. And you, you of course, have your own marriage and your own experience. So I'm curious... After all that time, is it like every marriage is a snowflake, it's complicated and nuanced, et cetera, et cetera? Or are you like, you know what, after all this time and all these conversations I've had and all these stories I've heard, it's really like we're all the same and we're all kind of dealing with a couple different elements in our marriage. Which, which side of the coin would you say you, you lean toward after all this? Uh, does it sound squishy if I say both? <laughs> Nothing's not an option. I you think have to pick it's one. Difficult. Yeah. One of the things that set sacred marriage apart, because I'm not a I'm not a therapist. I don't have a licensed counselor's experience or license or degree. So I was writing it more as a pastor, a spiritual director. And I was one of the first that was saying, you know, every marriage, even the best of marriages, have difficult moments. It goes back to James 3 2. We yeah. all stumble in many ways. And so I'm saying, look, you're, you're not marrying the fourth member of the Trinity. Nobody gets to do that. That person doesn't exist. The Bible's promising you the person you marry is going to frustrate you. And not just occasionally, he says in many ways, and not just if you make a bad choice, he says, we all stumble mm. in many ways. And so universally, there are going to be difficulties in every marriage. But the way that yeah. works out, that's very particular. That's why I was being squishy and saying both. They're, they've all got certain patterns and difficulties. Some are more difficult than others. Some face issues that others don't. It's very different when you have two people that are repentant and surrendering to God and wanting to love their spouse mm-hmm. out of reverence for God, and it's an act of worship. It's different if only one is doing that. It's different if both of them are pretty nominal in their face. So there are a lot of differences, but I think difficulty does sort of underscore what a lot of marriages will face, just as I hope 
happiness will be an undertone of most marriages as well, at least at times and seasons. Mm -hmm. Is that some of what has uh, made you write the books about pre-marriage, you know, like as you're looking for a spouse and then you have books around that space too? Is that, has that informed some of those books is going like, man, people need to know that it's funny. Um, my wife and I help with the young adults ministry at our church and uh, we've seen a few people get married and it's, it's interesting sitting with them in those seasons because, um, you know, some of them sort of grasp the difficulty a little better than others do. And, uh, but there's no way around like, they, you know, and then they sit with you and they go like, Hey, I'm freaking out, but it's okay. Right. And you're like, well, I mean, it's, it's okay, but you need to fully understand the difficulty of what you're doing. Um, but I'm yeah. sure that's informed why you wanted to write those books is because you sit with these married couples and you go, man, I bet there's some things that would help if you knew before getting in that may, you know. Yeah, 100%. It's why I wrote The Sacred Search because I saw that Christians were getting married for the same reasons as non-Christians. Hmm. And none of those reasons foretold a happy, successful, or intimate marriage. They weren't applying their faith. And I, it may sound weird or an outlier. I'm just one of those who believe Jesus really knew what he was talking about, that the best life is one that's lived in worship of Jesus and according to what he teaches us. When he says in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, those two things, basing your life on seeking first his kingdom and growing in righteousness, I believe are what set up most marriages. Because selfishness is what drags so many marriages down. I tell couples, don't yeah. worry about falling out of love. Yeah. Infatuation has a shelf life of about 12 to 18 months. Worry about falling out of purpose because you're going to get a little mm -hmm. bit bored with each other. Just because a human condition, none of us are so fascinating that we can keep somebody enthralled for 50 or 60 years. Now, you can do it for five <laughs> or six dates. Five or six years, you right. pretty much right. know each other. 50 or 60, yeah. you don't have a chance. But when you're seeking first God's kingdom every day, over your comfort, mm -hmm. over your enrichment, over your fulfillment, and even your happiness, that purpose mm -hmm. is driving you. And then if I'm seeking first yeah. his righteousness, yeah. I'm dying to the things that turn off most wives, that frustrates most wives. And I'm growing in the qualities um, Paul lists them, compassion, kindness, gentleness, patience, and love in Colossians 3. Well, most women want a husband who's growing in those things. Yeah. But yeah. more often, Christians are getting married, not for those reasons, but an infatuation, which mm. we know doesn't last, sexual chemistry, right. which sexual satisfaction in marriage isn't sustained by sexual chemistry. That lasts about as long as infatuation and compatibility on a date. And the problem with that, yeah. just because well, I feel like this toward this person, I want to get physical with this person, we have a fun time on a date. Well, I should say, well, that tells you how well you'll do on vacation. <laughs> how often mm -hmm. do you get to go on vacation? Will you, will it sustain you the other 50 weeks of the year? And so I yeah. really wanted Christians to put their faith first in choosing who they marry. I still believe God can use a difficult marriage to help you grow. But look, we're going to have crosses in this life regardless of what choices we make, we don't need to make them even more painful mm. than they need to be. And I think if you compromise yeah. on faith when you're getting married, you're opening the door to more difficulty and suffering. In your now, I was just going to say, as we're talking about the pre-marriage space, I mean, you know, my wife and I have been married for 18 years now. We just celebrated our 18-year anniversary. And you know, in a way, every anniversary, you know, we, of course, talk about like, all right, what were we doing right now during this time or whatever? And it sends me back to that, that space before marriage. And I do not envy people who are in that space trying to figure out, is this it? Is this the one? You know, you're all looking for that for sure guarantee because marriage is such, it's a lifelong commitment, you know? And I just, I have, I tip my hat to anyone who's, who's working with couples in that space. Cause it's just, it's almost easier once you're married. Cause it's like, all right, we're, we're in here. Now we can just deal with what's happening. You know, have you found in the time that you have done this, that there have been any things, um, sort of like ideas you had when you began writing books about marriage that over time have changed any significant views that you've seen like, man, this, 
I thought this, but I'm really finding this now. I think a couple things. I, I got a chance to update. I get a chance to update almost all of them, frankly. If they keep selling, hmm. publishers will re-release them, and they'll give me a chance to update them, which I'm glad. Part of that is just cultural names that fall out of favor. It's amazing yeah. how quickly culture moves with the, who's famous and who's not. But uh, a couple things. I think when Sacred Marriage first came out, a subtitle is, What if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? Some people started saying, instead of happy. And they put the two against each other. So when I updated it, I used a quote from John Wesley who said, I don't know anybody who's truly happy who's not pursuing mm. holy. That holiness and happiness mm -hmm. don't fight each other. It's holiness that I think leads to the greatest happiness. It's that sense of yeah. emotional satisfaction that we want or emotional euphoria that leads us to a lot of misery. And so holiness, yeah, yeah. I think, is the threshold and the protector of happiness, not the enemy. And so I was able to make that a little bit clear. I think what I also didn't understand was the need for differentiation that's a more recent discussion that people are having. It's all about becoming one in those days and how do you become one and how do you sacrifice yourself for your spouse and whatnot. And, and I think I really talk about that, the call to sacrifice, the call to put my wife's needs above my own. And there is a place for that. And that's what it means to be a servant. But if that's taught without hmm. differentiation, you really can run into a problem where it's two individuals. We both have to pursue God. And this is this is what's so key. Just because your wife isn't happy with you doesn't mean God isn't happy with you. I think I too much identified my wife's displeasure with God's disfavor. Now, it might be. It might be. But a lot of times you have to do what's right. I, I mean, David's wife, Michael, despised him for worshiping God. God said David was right and Michael was wrong. So there's got to be a certain differentiation that I'm doing this out of reverence for God. I'm going to do what I think is best for my wife, even if she doesn't think it's best. That's not a big issue in my own marriage, but I've just seen it in others. I wish I would have. Well, I just didn't know about it. I think the mm. third thing that's mm -hmm. changed, I think all of us who are writing Christian books 25 years ago, the way we talk about sex mm. is a lot different there was, and, and maybe coming out of the purity movement or whatnot, or as pornography was rising, there was this fear of guys need this or they're going to fall into pornography or whatnot. And we knew that pornography was so pervasive. I think we have to be more precise in the way we talk about it. And I, I did this in a book I wrote with Deborah Falada, Married Sex, where the Song of Songs begins in verse two with the wife talking about how she has no higher pleasure than making love to her husband. That God created sex for the wife as much as for the husband. Um, it's not ever, I would never blame a wife if a husband is cheating on her either digitally in the internet or, you know, with a, a live person or whatnot. Um, and I think while by God's grace, as people have looked back at sacred marriage, God kept me from the worst of those tendencies of some of the people that were writing around that time. I think now I'm just more aware of that and how to express it, that I do think every aspect of marriage involves some mm. sacrifice of our time, yeah. of our hobbies. Conversation sometimes can feel like a sacrifice, even though it's a duty. And I think the same thing is mm -hmm. going to be true somewhat in the bedroom at times. I've been, mm. I've been married 40 years. And so there are going to be times when I might not be entirely in the mood, mm. but I know my wife is. And, you know, you say, well, this is this is a good thing to do. But when you make that the norm or feel mm -hmm. like an obligation, it actually can really mess up marriages. So um, yeah. I want to stress the mutual pleasure in marriage more than maybe people heard in the past. Johnny, 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 Johnny. Hey, Dave. I thought thought you might sing back. No, I'm just, no it's okay. Let me uh, just let me just read. I can sing. No, let me read to... the ad. Okay. 
Sorry. John it's Summer's okay. finally here. Sorry, nope, too late. Just, okay. John Summer's finally here, and yeah, that means is. more days spent outside the mm-hmm. park, mm-hmm. on the beach, mm-hmm. or in the pool. And oh, if yeah. you're really lucky, all three of those all in one three. day. We call that the trifecta. Make sure you're taking extra care of your hair this summer, since sun, salt, and SPF alliteration can all affect your hair health. Now is the perfect time to start taking Nutrafol. Nutrafol. I knew you were going to say Don't Nutrafol. Do that. Don't Look, do that. Dave. Dave. There we go. <laughs> Nutrafol <laughs> is the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement with over, listen to this. Okay. You need to sit down. A uh, hundred people. <laughs> Try again. 2,000. Try again. One, I, I'm going to cut you off because okay. you're taking too long. One million people seeing thicker, stronger, faster growing hair with less shedding. Physician formulated with drug-free ingredients, Nutrafol's hair growth supplements are clinically tested to multi-target key root causes of thinning. And with Nutrafol, building a hair growth routine, it's simple. So easy. Purchase online, right? Yep. No prescription or doctor's visit yep, required. That's it. Uh-uh. There it Free is. shipping and automated deliveries ensure that you'll never miss a day. How See, long res- does it take, do you well, think? If you would just... Sorry, I got stop excited. Stop interrupting me. I should okay? just read the copy. Now, now right I want here. you to stand up. Okay. See results in three to six months. Get results you can run your fingers through. For a limited time... That's a good line. For yeah, a limited is. time, Nutrafol is offering our listeners $10 off your first month subscription and free shipping when you go to Nutrafol.com and enter the promo code DADVILLE. Nutrafol.com, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com. That's promo good. code Dadville. That's Nutrafol.com, promo code Dadville. Hey, can we stop for a second? Yeah. I actually have a question that I've been thinking ask me, for years. Ask I've been trying to ask you this. Yeah. What's the most you've seen something grow? This is an easy answer, John. Yeah. I okay. once had a bamboo plant. Okay. And it literally grew 20 feet Every week. What? It was the craziest thing I've ever seen. That's pretty impressive. Mm-hmm. Also, but, my love for my wife. Oh, there we go. That's, that's what I was... Shoot. Let me... Let me start over. No, we can't. Okay. Okay. I think I know something that can help your business grow even faster than bamboo. Right? Listen. What's that sound, Dave? Could it be... Shopify? Of course. <laughs> because no one is better at helping businesses grow than Shopify. That's right, Dave. That's right. Shopify grows with your business no matter how far or big you grow. Hmm. Thanks to an endless list of integrations and third-party apps, anything you can think of, from on-demand printing to accounting to chatbots, oh. everything you need to revolutionize your business. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way because businesses that grow Grow with Shopify. Shopify. Sign up. I wanted to say that with you. That's my line. That's probably the coolest part of the end. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at Shopify.com slash Dadville. All All lowercase. See, I can jump in on this. Don't do that. Go to to Shopify.com slash Dadville now to grow Grow. your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash Dadville. I just want to read some of it by myself. No, I'm here too. It's so crazy that you said that because I think two of the things that I've, I grew up in the church and was really involved in Campus Crusade in college, um, which was wonderfully beneficial, but, you know, was reading a lot of Christian sort of like books and, and you know, uh, and, and I think it's two things that really, I think, um, could be detrimental, which you literally just spoke exactly to for me coming out of, you know, that season, like you said, of sort of. Christian things in that that era were one exactly what you said this idea that like men's need especially in a sexual um way are sort of paramount and like women just deal with it right like this is and that and it's not that that was necessarily taught that way but I think there was kind of an undercurrent in 20 years ago of kind of like you know like he's he's this kind of like John and I were laughing like he's a werewolf that has to be satiated and just like you know yeah Right. It has to yeah, be fed, and I think that's ex- that's beautifully said. Night. So one is that, but then oh, two, and take you spoke all the responsibility this. away from the guys. Yeah, yeah, and then I think two, which is really interesting, is um, 
the differentiation piece, which is so, you said that so beautifully that I have struggled with in seasons of my marriage of kind of like, which was kind of taught a little bit back then, which was like, Hey man, you stand in front of your wife and God will speak to you. And then you sort of like turn around and tell your wife what he says, (laughs) because you're the head of the family. And, and, and I think, uh, while some, you know, that is true in its way, we're also two people. And I've really gotten in trouble in my marriage when I start to basically become this codependent thing we talk about now, but where I'm sort of taking on, I'm onboarding her emotions and sort of going like, you know, how you feel is how I feel. And if I'm not careful, it's how I feel like God feels about me. Which is funny because my wife struggles none with that. <laughs> you know, like she's, she's like, go figure it out. Oh my God. <clears throat> but in my dark days, I have to really be careful that sort of her uh, sadness or anger or displeasure or whatever that I'm sort of taking on. And even more than that, I would say, really believing that God is um, in relationship with her and he may be teaching her things that are that I'm not being taught at all that I mean, you know, that he has not decided to reveal to me, whatever those things are and vice versa and holding space for that and being okay. We've both had to learn this, that like you don't sort of experience everything together all the time. And I think there's a, there's a trick sometimes, especially in Christendom where it's kind of like you are one and therefore every experience and every bit of teaching and every emotion is to be this coagulated thing of two people becoming one. And it has just done my marriage so much good to go, man, I may have this thought from the Lord that Annie goes, I don't know. I don't feel that. And I'm like, that's okay. You know, or like she may feel the called to do something that I'm like, I just don't really want to do that. Or I don't feel and she does it and vice versa. And we do it together, whatever. But that has just helped me out so much. And I do think I love the way you said that, Gary, because I think that's very articulate that especially for a season in Christendom, it felt like there was a little bit of confusion around that space. You know what I mean? Sort of like we serve together. We are always together. Everything is together, together. And it's like, you know, it, it really informs so much of how you think about marriage if you're not careful. You know, I got some pushback when I did a blog post lauding Vashti Mm. for saying no in the book of Esther when the king wanted her to come out. um, And uh, I quoted and this is like a 19th century preacher said, let let parents call their daughters Vashti and whatnot. And of course, nobody does. They might choose Esther. But and I had people just say, no, Vashti was not you should never reject your husband's call or whatnot. And so Mm. that's still buried in some sectors of Christianity um, that you could come to disagreement. Another book that's helped me with that is Brant Hansen's Unoffendable, um, where it's Mm -hmm. just, this could be their issue. And that's not impactful on you. If you're married to a negative person, they're going to be negative about you and the kids and other people. So you shouldn't be offended when they're negative about you. That's that's them. That's not you. And you've got to learn to say, okay, mm. that, that, that's all right. Um, and yeah. I just wasn't as aware of that. Pursuing oneness, uh, it, it was, mm. there was a blindness I had. You know, I was going to ask this later on, but you, it kind of segues into this. Like you've written obviously so many books and given the subject matter that you've tackled in some of these books, I would imagine you you have received quite a bit of pushback and, and criticism, which is something, you know, Dave and I, with this podcast, with our, our music careers, you know, we've had our share of that. How do you deal with that? Because that, that is a tough thing for anyone who's in any sort of public space. Not very well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the best person to ask because I... Same. I, same. I had... Good. Um, so we deal with it the same. Yeah, I, I had I, I had a number of years where just in the Christian community, I think I was spoken well of and a growing reputation. And then, what, 2016, I wrote um, a blog post, Enough is Enough, Why the Church Needs to Support Women in Abuse Marriage and Help Them Get Out of It. I just, I, mm-hmm. I think it was a God appointment where I was at a women's conference and some of the stories these women were telling me about what these husbands were doing that were appalling, thinking that they had to put up with that. Um, And I had a national leader that called me up and he said, Gary, if you don't renounce this post, you're going to lose 20 years of one of the best reputations in the world talking about relationships. And I said, well, I I can't. I think this is the case. And so that kind of started it. And then um, Uh, The biggest thing, I think, was a few years back, I wrote a book with Deborah Fleda on married sex, a 
another author had asked both of us to endorse a prior book of hers. And Deborah and I just both said no because we felt like while her book had some good points, she was completely misrepresenting other people and that her marketing is done by attacking every other book so that my book's the only one you could read. Every other one is polluted. And I didn't think she was being fair. And we knew her group would come after ours. And sure enough, Mm. they really did. Just lying about what we said, misrepresenting it. They'll take a paragraph and, and blow it up. And when you're writing about sex, it's really easy to do that. If you take something out, I mean, it's, I mean, just, just talking about sex opens you up to ridicule or whatnot. I mean, if you're a novelist and you try to write a sex, you got to have mercy. You got to be crazy to do that. But even in nonfiction, just dealing with those issues. And I thought, that's why I wanted to write it with a woman who was a counselor and we could talk through these issues and we did. But when a marketing plan is based on, I get attention by attacking other people and this is the next thing to attack. Um, you know, that, that's a challenge. Now, in every case, every book I've written, when I update it, I think I could have said that better, or maybe I shouldn't have emphasized this or that. So I'm never pretending a book that I release is perfect, uh, but it really hurts to see it misrepresented. Yeah, and, uh, I'm sure. you know, I, I think that that's what gets so frustrating. But, you know, it's in the music world as well. I did a couple of books mm. actually with Michael W. Smith and, uh, he talked about this great reputation, and then there's one song, something about a rose, or was a metaphor or something that some DJ just had. It was New Ages or something. That Michael W. Smith has gone New Ages and just basically killed the record on arrival that a lot of Christian stations wouldn't play it. And you know, Michael had this great reputation, and it's been well earned, and he's produced a great body of work. And one person saying, well, this is actually what this means. He's taking a metaphor and making it literal. I think, I I just think it's going to be true for everybody. I just think I'm worse than most (laughs) at handling it. I I take it personally. I get angry. Um, I deal with emotions that a Christian shouldn't deal with. It really, and then that makes me feel ashamed. How come I can't just forgive and forget about it? Some people seem to enjoy conflict. Um, I've always hated it. And so, uh, yeah, I hate that part of what's happened online. As John and I were getting ready for this podcast, something we haven't talked a lot about, which I I think is, you know, because we have a lot of people that listen that are married and and some that have been married a while. I mean, thing that it's fascinating, like you talk about in uh, making your marriage a fortress, like this idea of, you know, people that have um, in, in, in other books, I mean, you have so many books, you talk about everything at some point. Right. But you know, the idea of tired marriages to marriages that have been together a while, right? Um, and something we haven't talked about a lot on Dadville um, is, you know, like we're coming up on, I think, 19 years, my wife and I, which is not old, but it's not, you know, it's... It's long enough it's to long know. Beautifully said. I love this idea, though. And John and I were both talking about how excited we were to think through, you know, your thoughts on this tired marriage. Like, marriages that have been together a while, especially when you have kids, like we have three that are 12... Well, sixth, third, and first grade, easiest way to say it. And so, you know, there's just days where you're just wiped, you know. And then we're seeing friends that are moving toward empty nest and uh, having beautiful conversations with some of those my, my my guy friends. And they're like, you know, some are really excited, but some are nervous, and you know, they're they're just worn out. So, can you speak to some of that idea about ter- tired managers and how how you manage that and what to look for to be careful of those things? I had a, a chapter in Sacred Marriage called Sacred History. And it talks about the different stages of marriage, where you can expect to see hits and whatnot. One of the first big ones is when you have a baby and oh, yeah. toddlers. Statistically speaking, that's just a tough time because you're tired. You're exhausted. It's hard to be romantic or even have time to be romantic. You're just trying to get by. And that's why I think my marathon running has really helped me because there are stages of a marathon where when I was trying to qualify for Boston, it's not just finishing. Mm, you yeah. got to go a certain time. And there's the holding back and it's easy. The first six, 10 miles should be really easy. And when you just get married and things are connected, sometimes it's okay. But then you've got to start making a choice every other mile. Hmm. Do I still want this? Am I going to slow down? And it's the same thing in marriage. Do I still want an intimate marriage? Or am I happy for us Hmm. to be roommates for a while? Am I happy for us to put the kids 
ahead of us for a while. I'm happy to focus more on my vocation. I'm going to get the deer, rebuild the car, become a scratch golfer, than I am to focus on my family. You have to keep Hmm. choosing that because we don't live in a world that's kind to our affection for each other. We live in a world that is creative and tearing us apart. It assaults us emotionally. It assaults us spiritually. It assaults us physically. You can get depressed. You can have spiritual warfare go against you emotionally. You, just get, you get tired or physically you're, you're exhausted. And, and you have to recognize that, that that's the point of commitment of marriage. I'm always going to keep choosing to come back to my marriage. And if I've let it slip, I'm going to recognize I made a vow to my wife not just mm. to not leave, but to keep cleaving. And if I've not done my share of that, I need to repent of it. And, and make it a, a priority. And so I, I don't think it's a coincidence that I wrote Sacred Marriage when mm. I'd been married 15 years, a little bit less than you guys. And then I wrote Cherish when we had been married, gosh, I don't know, maybe mm. 30 years, um, because we were entering the empty yeah. nest stage. And it's a whole lot easier to focus on each other again and to aspire after something mm. like a cherishing marriage when you're through the busy, exhausting, conflicting years mm. of parenthood. So um, I, I think you just accept that mm. marriage has its stages. Yeah. You want to do the best you can, whatever stage you're in, but you don't evaluate mm. your marriage when you're in wow. one of those really tricky mm. seasons, like when you've got yeah. young kids. That's, I, one time I, and I'd be stupid, I've, I've lived until I moved to Colorado at sea level my entire life. And I had an event in Aspen, Colorado, and I was in good shape. I was running a lot. I was at this resort in Aspen, and so I was going to go for a quick run. And when you're at a resort in Aspen, if you go for a run, you're going down, right? It's the only way to go. Aspen. And I felt fine because I'm going downhill. And then I turn around and try to run up. Yeah. I can't breathe because I'm going uphill. And I'm in Aspen, which is 9,000 feet above where I usually live. It didn't mm. mean I wasn't in shape. It meant the climate and the terrain was yeah. fighting against me. And I want to say in, to marriages, it doesn't mm, mean you're not great. a good couple. It means the climate and the terrain mm. are fighting against you. Don't mm. reset your expectations, but redouble on your determination. Yeah, look at that. You're such a preacher. That was such a beautiful <laughs> analogy. <laughs> so, so question, you have kids. How old are your kids? They're all grown. Three kids. So how old, are they? how old are they? Oh, they're all 30s. The youngest okay. just like turned 30. Okay. And then uh, I tried to throw shade at one of them. How does it feel to be a third of a century old? And well, that's when my son turned 33 and goes, how does it feel to have a son who's a third of a century old? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a great rebuttal. <laughs> he can um, throw shade back. So let me ask you, what is it like having grown children? Oh, man. It's um, Gigi Graham, who is the... Well, I'm not supposed to call her the oldest daughter of Billy and Ruth Graham. She said she doesn't like that. She said, yeah. call me the daughter they love the longest. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she, she's the first one who vocalized to me. People never warned us that being a parent of adult kids is so much harder than being a parent of younger kids. Wow. And I think there are a lot of reasons why that's true. It's yeah. evil to try to control adult kids. <laughs> uh-huh. there, there are so many other things. Um, you, you've got to kind of control the schedules of your young kids and you mm. protect them and whatnot. But there's a time when you have to keep letting out as the kids get older into their teens and then when they're from your home completely and and whatnot. And the consequences of their choices, it's hard not to take them personally. I think it's wrong to take mm-hmm. them personally. Um, a man whose faith I respect as much as about as anybody, his ministry has so impacted me. Um, and and he had a child that was just breaking his heart. Mm. And his his mentor was Dallas Willard. Imagine that, Dallas mm. Willard is a mentor. But um, Dallas Willard said, this will be uh, a test of your joyfulness in Christ. Wow. Will you let your adult child's decisions undercut your joy in Christ? If so, you're making yourself vulnerable to a person who James 3, 2 stumbles in many ways. Um, so I'm, it, it's going to be a book someday, what I've learned. 
mm-hmm. about adult kids because you have to recognize maybe you did really mess up. How do you come to terms with that? I desperately right. wanted yeah. to be the best dad in the whole wide world. I read the books. I listened to Focus on the Family. We prayed. We talked. I mean, all of those things. But then I have to realize I didn't know what I was doing half the time. I was in my 20s. I'm not a psychologist. I don't think of myself as this particularly wise person and and whatnot. So how do you come to grips with something that you really wanted to do, an especially good job? There are areas where you may have failed. And you can go to your yeah. kids and you can ask for their forgiveness, but whatnot. Learning to let go, learning not to expect. It's so easy. Boy, older parents do this so easy. I sacrificed for you. I did this for you. I raised you right. I'm not getting gratitude. I'm not getting anniversary cards or whatnot. Did you give to your kids or did you trade with your kids? Was wow. It, I'm giving to you, but I expect to return. That's not giving. That's yeah. trading. I take care of you now and you take care of me later. There, are, We could do a whole show on that on some time. But yeah, it's it's been a tough time. But talking to a lot of parents who have gone through this and are even past it, uh, it, it, it's just been encouraging to see it's kind of a universal thing. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> John, why did you miss our entire Memorial Day weekend? I knew you were mad about that. You've been weird all week. Look, here's <sighs> here's what happened. Okay. I was waiting for my subscription razors to arrive, and they never did. Oh, well. You know me. Yeah. I'm not going to be seen on Memorial Day. <laughs> That's my big weekend every year <laughs> without a clean shave so i stayed inside the whole oh, that freaking explains time. you staring out of the window so longingly yeah. john you got to meet henson shaving it's a family-owned mm. aerospace parts manufacturer they just uh-huh. make parts for you had me at aerospace that, that has made parts for the mars rover which okay. is very different from a land rover and now they are though all th- both not that different i was gonna now that yeah. and now that they're bringing precision engineering to your shaving experience the game has changed john okay the you game, said mars rover mm-hmm. right like the rover on Mars, like the planet, you're saying. John. <laughs> Henson Shaving's innovation minimizes the blade extension, addressing the root cause, pun int- intended there, <laughs> of bad shaves. Its aerospace background has enabled the creation of razors with unmatched precision, a point zero zero one three inch blade extension to be exact. Wow. Less than a human hair's thickness. Wow. Now, Dave. Mm-hmm. I'm told that the Henson razor works with standard dual-edged blades, right? Yeah. To give you that old-school shave, mm-hmm. but with the benefits of new-school tech. Okay. Am I right on that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And once you own a Henson mm-hmm. razor, it's only about 3 to $5 yeah. per year to replace the no, blade. No, that's all true. All that checks out? Yes, and the razor has built-in channels to evacuate hair and cream, making cloggy. <laughs> logging. <laughs> Listen, I start laughing, John, because it's just <laughs> ridiculous. It makes clogging virtually impossible. Uh, I can't wait to get my new hints and razor yeah. and listen you need one too okay oh. i've been saying that for oh, geez well just right now i just said it for the first time okay. it's time to say no to subscriptions people and yes to a razor that'll last you a lifetime visit hensonshavingcom slash dadville to pick the razor for you and use the code dadville and you'll get two years no. worth of blades free with your razor just make sure to add them to your cart. How do they even make money, John? Right? They're not interested in no, making no. money. Uh, well, well, <laughs> that's 100 free blades, John, when you head to Henson Shaving. That's H-E-N-S-O-N-S-H-A-V-I-N-G dot com slash Dadville and use the code Dadville. Spending too much time in my catron, making meals. Hmm. That, did you just come up? I like that. Well, it's is that a, your new single? It's a new single that I'm working on, and okay. it's called Dave. Yes. This summer, weather is looking so nice. I don't want to be spending too much time in my kitchen. Ma- and then meals. making meals in parentheses. <laughs> okay. Listen, it's funny because that's not just the title of your song, John. That's a, that's a feeling that I relate to. Okay? Yeah. Can I tell you what happens now, though? Go ahead. That's where Factor comes in. Oh. Yep. This ties in so it well. It really does. Actually. Actually, I should, we should probably record this. You yeah. can fuel up with Factor's no prep. No mess meals, so you can spend more time where, John? Outside. Not in the kitchen. But Dave, yeah. hey, can I meet my wellness goals with Factor? 
<laughs> John, you're so stupid. You know it. Factor has chef crafted meals with options like Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. And Factory's fresh, never <laughs> frozen meals are dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. Two minutes. That yes. sounds amazing. Yep. All right. I'm ready to kickstart my routine with 35 Ooh. different meals and more than 60 add ons to choose oh. from. I mean, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. And these are restaurant quality meals like filet mignon. Yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And black and salmon. That one I just say <laughs> yeah, straight up. That's not, of course, it's not French at all. No. Enjoy effortless support for your lifestyle. Choose from six menu preferences to help you manage calories, maximize protein intake, avoid meat, or simply eat well balanced. Head to factormeals.com slash dadville50 and use code dadville50 to get. <laughs> That's right. Yep. 50% off they your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code DADVILLE50 at factormeals.com slash DADVILLE50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. Have you, have you seen, I'm curious, um, I feel like m- my friends and I have each kind of had seasons of this where you sort of like – sit with your parents in your sort of twenties could be thirties whenever and kind of start having some of those conversations where you're kind of like, you know, Hey, this was sort of a, this was tough. And I don't know if you know that. And I love you as my parent and I'm trying to be respectful, but like, I kind of feel like we need to talk about this or we, you know, um, cause it, it feels like there's, it almost happens sort of in mass. I found that it's like the kids go out, you know, and you sort of live a life and you start going, man, I have some feelings about <laughs> some things, um, that maybe are not. Or a lot unearthed. of times you get married and your spouse is like, "You ever notice how this kind of ha- kind of <laughs> weird in your family life?" <laughs> but I mean, how have you? One, have you had to navigate that? And then, how have you done that? Like, what what does that look like for y'all? And and because I can't imagine. I mean, like John and I talk about this so much, but like you know, I'm just stealing myself. And my kids are still tiny, yeah. but I'm like. I'm just stealing myself for the moment that I get that call. It's like, Hey dad, can we, you know, the 25 year old calls and says, can we go to lunch? And I'm like, this is it. This is going to be like, so but we think about it all the time. Yeah. Here's the Amy list and I of are things. always like, it's going to be the thing that we swore we nailed. It's not going to be the thing that we prepare for. It's going to be the thing that we swore we did. Well. <laughs> I, I was the same, but let me ask either of you, what was the name of Moses's son? Oh boy. John knows uh, this one. No, I want to say Shep, but that's uh, that's Noah. That it, it's it's kind of a rhetorical. I've never had anybody that could answer. It's Gershon. Oh, Gershon. It's not that uh, you should I was going to say there's a lag here. I said <laughs> Gershon. I think I got cut out. <laughs> yeah. But w- I grew up in this thinking, and and they used Jonathan Edwards as an example about had so many college presidents and pastors and politicians and whatnot, and then found out it kind of stuff that happened with slavery, and that kind of blew apart part of that example. But, um. That if you're really a faithful Christian and whatnot, your kids will carry on and, and be that. But the fact is, when you look at biblical characters, some of the most godly people had kids that were terrible. And some of the most wicked people mm-hmm. had godly offspring. And you're like, how does this happen? And so I think you ask things I've learned. I think... For me growing up and in my writing, there was two direct connection between you follow God, raise your family right, and we almost idolized family life. Jesus Mm -hmm. is very clear that faith sometimes will split families apart. Mm -hmm. If they're all following Jesus, faith cements us together. But if they're not, some parents will have to make the choice, do I follow Jesus or do I try to keep my child's respect. I I hope a Mm -hmm. parent would never completely alienate their child, but often it's the children who are alienating the parents saying, Mm -hmm. if you don't agree with me, I'm out of here and I'm done. So does the parent change their belief or do they say, look, I love you. You're welcome. I want to be here, but I, I, I can't agree with what you're doing. But To go back to your first question about me with my parents, see, mine are probably 20 years older than yours. My dad just turned 95, and he's still with us by God's mercy. My mom is 89. I never had those conversations with them because I love them. I don't know if they would know how to navigate them. We just didn't have conversations like that when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And 
I, you know, I think my mom is, is simple in the sense that my favorite thing that I do for her is she, she loves these hostess snowballs. They're just chemicals with <laughs> yes. coconut and pink Colorful frosting. chemicals. No yes. food in them, but she she loves them, and she can't get them where she is because Hostess was sold. And but there are stores here in Colorado. I'm her favorite son when I bring her a <laughs> six pack. Of, but but having and and thanking her, but having these emotional conversations about it, I didn't get to say. I I just don't know mm. what that would serve, but I wish we could have. I certainly want to open that with my kids. I did have the conversation mm. with my kids. Right after they were all gone, look, I know mm. I, I'm sorry about this or I feel like I didn't do that. And and they didn't really want to go on with it. If they had mm. it now, I would be open to it. Mm. One of the big things, I might lose your readers now or they think I'm a monster. <laughs> when, when, I was ra- when we were raising our kids, the first two were born in the late 80s. The third was born in early 90s, 92. Um, you know, all the rage was you, you discipline your child if you love your child. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I have a gentle bent. It's not my nature to do that. And we use corporal punishment very mm-hmm. sparingly. Mm-hmm. Um, we just that, but now people would say any corporal punishment is abuse. Right. And some people that I really respect, I, I don't know mm-hmm. if we would if we had kids now. I'm not the how to parenting guy. So. I'll let people debate that. But we were told at the time by people with PhDs and with studies, and they would quote scripture, spare the rod, spoil the child. Right. If you love your child, this is what you will do. Well, I love my child, and sometimes I could make myself. And then I hear one person say, well, that's why your son can't remember his early childhood memories because he had corporal discipline. Now, he didn't mm. have it that much. Mm. But, but I'm basically being told you spoiled your kid's childhood because mm. you did – what you thought you were supposed to. That doesn't necessarily excuse me. Mm. And maybe before God, mm. I have to say, Lord, I, I see why I made that choice. It was the wrong choice. I'm sorry. But but that's the kind of thing where I'm open to those conversations with my kids because I'm, I'm free from thinking I had to be the perfect parent. I can yeah. say yeah. I gave it my best shot. But it's like I tried five marathons before I qualified for Boston. Mm. I gave it yeah. my best shot. I wasn't fast enough. It took me a number of years to get there. And with parenting, the thing is, you don't, you don't get a second chance. That's right. what's so hard. Yeah. Um, I've seen parents do that with oops babies, you know, when the last child is eight to 10 years. I'll tell you this with my, they're always easier on the oops baby than they were on the mm-hmm. first few babies yeah. without, without exception. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And mm-hmm. maybe we should have been too. Yeah. So one thing that I think about a lot in my wife and I's marriage is the empty nest transition. You know, we are, our girls are eight and 11, so we've got a long way to go, but I can already, you know, I'm doing the math and I'm like, all right, Luca, our oldest, you know, in seven years, she's going to be out of the house. And like, we're at the halfway point with Livy, our youngest one. So like I can, I'm feeling every hour that's going by, it's getting faster and faster and faster. And so I, I think a lot about that transition. I know that it's a really, it can be a great transition. It can be a really dicey transition for a marriage. How did it go for you guys? What was your experience like? And, and do you have any ad- advice? Yeah, I think it was a sweet experience for us. We never yearned to be empty nesters. We had three. We wish we could have had more. Mm-hmm. There's some medical reasons where we just couldn't have. Um so we loved being parents and we weren't the ones saying we are counting down the days. I, I yeah. was the opposite. I was like, man, I wish we could, could make this last. I loved being an active dad, but it sweet years for our marriage. Um, mm-hmm. I felt like we were able to reconnect my mom, my, my mom, boy, talk about a Freudian slip. My wife <laughs> <laughs> was, was so focused on being a mom. She, mm-hmm. she had homeschooled up through eighth grade. She was there. She would throw the blowout birthday parties. And I mean, she was just so focused on them. Yeah. But then when they were gone, she was able to turn that around. And, and then it was more on our marriage. Mm. And um, for me, I was able to work longer hours guilt-free, which was a lot of fun. Whenever yeah. my kids were yeah. young, mm. there's the guilt. 
I got to provide for him. I should be working. If I'm working, I got to emotionally provide for him. I should be at home. I never fully right. resolved that. It tore mm. me apart. Well, an empty nest blows that up. You can work and work and work till you're tired and, and you don't feel so guilty as long as your wife is okay with it. And it gives you more time to focus on each other. So yeah. for us, it was sweet. But here's the warning for people in your age. If your marriage is about raising your kids, you're going to be like teammates when the season ends and your kids are gone. <laughs> There's nothing left holding right. you together. Mm-hmm. It's really foolish to let your marriage become just about raising your kids because especially with people living long now, I said like my dad is 95, my mom's 89. Lisa and I are going to be married for so much longer without kids than Mm -hmm. we were with kids if we live to be that age. And that's by God's design. Um, And I was really struck. I knew this before my kids left home. A woman who wrote a great book on children of adult children whose parents got divorced when they were adults. Mm. And she said for her, it was worse than if she was young. Because she Mm. said, when you're a young adult, it's like you're putting together a puzzle and you're almost finished. A few pieces are there. And then somebody comes and overturns the table. And the fact that you are closer to finishing the puzzle makes it feel worse. Mm. And I, one of my best friends did a study on what it did to young adults when their parents got divorced after they left home. And he came to the conclusion that it was worse for them. So Mm. for your children's sake, make your marriage a priority. Mm, Um, Don't let it become just about raising kids. Don't let conversations be just about with the kids. You've got to be connected. We, We didn't like the thought of our kids leaving home, but we are never afraid. What are we going to do as a couple when our kids were gone? Um, yeah. I just got to be honest. One of the things I really liked, you, you can have sex at 6 p.m. <laughs> I mean, it's no big deal. Or right. in the morning on a Saturday or in the afternoon. If I mean, it's just like there's a lot to privacy that you didn't have as a married couple oh, yeah. with kids. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They do not like the locked doors, FYI. They, they do yeah, you don't have to have the doors. Yeah, kids go watch television. Um, right? So, so which what a wonderful way to sort of end it. So, thank you for hanging. We have a speed round we end with, and okay. uh, I hope you are emotionally prepared for this. Um, your acuity is there. So, um, I'll ask the first one: If you could run a marathon anywhere in the world, where would you run it? Well, I did it. Um, I ran the Munich Marathon oh. uh, because it ends in the same stadium, the Olympic stadium where Frank no. Shorter won his gold medal. No and way. that's what got me hooked on long distance running. That is Was so that the cool. first one you did? No, it was the it's the last one I did. Oh, really? Actually. It's sort of a bucket list thing. I looked at Frank Shorter with these little pencil arms. Yeah. And I said, Hey <laughs> I could look like that. <laughs> um, and the decathlon, you know, that yeah. that, that kind of was imposing i would have loved that but i knew i didn't have the ability and so getting to run the marathon in in munich and then finishing that stadium uh was uh it, it was a great experience that and i so love munich so yeah is it, is it very it. hilly i've never been is it hilly or flat um, or? No, it's not no it's not too bad okay okay yeah all right what author has had the most influence on you fiction or non-fiction both let's give one each okay yeah. fiction Susan Howitch. She is brilliant. She wrote a series called the Starbridge series on the history of the Church of England. The characters are, they, they all do spiritual direction with her and whatnot. And it's novels that challenge me, transform me. Wow. Uh, I loved it. I think she's a genius. Say her name one more time. Susan Howitch, okay. H-O-W-A-T-C-H. Sometimes I don't give her name because um, <laughs> every... You, you got to read them in order. So they should start with glittering images because they okay. the books build on each other. Every character, man and woman in her novels, has sexual hangups. And uh, that bothers people. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know who she hangs with. But <laughs> <laughs> it comes out. And, and some people in Christian circles, you don't talk about that. So that's going to bug people. Nonfiction, that, it's really hard because I've read so many of the Christian classics. When it comes to spiritual formation... I probably lean toward Dallas Willard. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think he's just a great thing. When it comes to theology, I've really appreciated N.T. Wright. Mm-hmm. When it comes for general inspiration, 
I've read a ton of J.I. Packer books. Mm -hmm. Never been disappointed with a single one. If you want the easiest nonfiction read that's really biblically based and so solid, pick up any J.I. Packer book and you won't be sorry. Yeah. Knowing God was a staple of our college years, I feel like. Uh, Okay. If you could have dinner, this is a tricky one, and I know you're going to feel like this is cheating, but well, here we go. If you could have dinner with any three people, dead or alive, which I know, I know, that's cheating, who would it be? Well, I'm, I'm just going to sound like a grandpa, but my grandkids are five and two, and right now it would be absolutely Anna and James would be the two. Aww. And then my wife there as well because they really like her. I know, that's a smarmy <laughs> thing when you talk about Because they really like her. <laughs> Well, they did. <laughs> That's the intro. I gotta tell you, it's it's the it's the gifts of life when it's in fact it, it's amazing to become infatuated, right? When mm. you're going to marry someone, there's nothing like it. Seeing your wife come down the aisle, I just love it as a pastor when I look over and I see this guy that I knew to be strong, and he sees this woman coming up to be his wife, and it's just destroying him. Mm-hmm. The feeling you get when your first child is placed in your mm. arms is overwhelming. I got to tell you, just the last couple months, I was with my grandson. He's two. We'd had some real fun times. And he looks up at me and goes, Papo, I love you. No. I go, I love you, bud. He goes, I love you. And he just kept going. And it, you, you keep getting that throughout life. Yeah. So God. I'm really low ambitions right here. But, yeah, I would, <laughs> I would say those two and my wife. That's great. All right. What's something like a quirk or something that, that not many people would know about you? Well, they might guess it from my books. I'm not clinically OCD, but I live in the neighborhood right next door to it. <laughs> so, Yeah, I feel like looking uh, at the bookshelf back there, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's there. You can well, see. I have my routines and whatnot, and I really yeah. needed to learn because uh, being married, when you value your routines hmm. and have kids, isn't always a good thing yeah. because marriage and kids blow up your yeah. routines. And so mm-hmm. I've I've learned – to get a little bit better at mm. that, but it still pushes me beyond my comfort zone. Yeah, yeah. The, the healthiest thing I think I've ever done is learn to realize that comfort can be an idol to me. Mm. Mm-hmm. I always used to think if this makes me feel uncomfortable, I've got to fix it. And sometimes, no, I have to do things that make me uncomfortable. Mm. And to always demand comfort is idolatry. Yeah. yeah, that's a good word. Okay, finally. Um, and it sounds like you'd you'd mentioned this earlier that may be happening. If you could write a book on fatherhood, what would it be called? Well, I, I didn't write the book, but I think one of the best ones I've read on fatherhood mm. has stupidly gone out of print. Shame mm. on the publisher. It's The Silence of Adam oh. by the late Larry Crabb. Uh, maybe because he just opened me up and splayed me out and I wouldn't let my wife read the book until I'd read it twice so I could start to apply it and with my personality <laughs> man he he nailed me yeah. he convicted me he yeah. confronted me on that that the silence of Adam is often mm. our failure today mm. not to speak up and I think as I look at our culture today um, boy I, I think that book should come I saw Larry Crabb before he died Hmm. And I just said, would you please bring that book out? Because I recommend it and whatnot. And he says, well, maybe I just need to update it. And I go, well, please do that. But he died like within a year or two after that and, hmm. and never got around to it. So yeah. more than I would write a book on fatherhood, I would just tell people to go read yeah, those crabs. Read that. That's mm-hmm. great. Our good friend, Ali Andrews, helped with that book, who's a counselor friend here in Nashville. Um, so, well, Gary, thank you a million times for your time. So valuable. Uh, God bless what you're doing in your ministry and your running uh, as you uh, take over cities in Europe one by yeah. one. We'll, How many miles are we running today? Have we already run? No, I didn't run today. I ran yesterday. Mm. But I got to tell you, this is a nice place to run. I can't imagine. Oh, I it bet. would kill me I running bet. in Colorado right now. You'd find me Yeah, you got to get used to the elevation. Oh, yeah. I, it took me almost a year. But once you do. A whole year. Well, oh, man. Look, I'm older and I lived at sea level literally my entire life. Yep. Seattle, Northern Virginia, and Houston. Oh, yep. yeah. Yeah. Well, now now you get back to sea level and you're like a Superman. Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. Thank, yeah. You thank you so much. All right. Yeah, thank really you, guys. Yeah, Delight yeah, talking you. with you. All right. Dum, 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 dum. Yeah.